Has anyone ever broken a promise to you before? Don't look at them now if they're here. (laughs) It really hurts when it happens to you. It can be devastating, so terrible that it could scar you for life. I remember such a time in my life. I was 12 years old. My great uncle made a huge promise to me. I trusted him that he would fulfill this promise. I believed him. I got so excited, I counted down the days, the hours, the minutes. I was so excited when the time came for him to take me to this thing that he promised he would do. He never showed up. I know. Broke my heart. And you can probably feel my pain and my hurt and my struggle. He promised to take me to see the monster trucks at the Silver Dome. (laughs) True story. I'm sure your broken promises are not quite as devastating as mine, but if they're close, then you will get a lot out of this message. You will appreciate it that when someone does honor their promise, fulfill their promise, it's a big deal. In fact, don't you kind of secretly hate it when someone isn't a person of their word? When they say they're going to do something and they don't do it, doesn't that bother you a little bit? Yeah, of course it does. Well, we like it when people honor their promises, don't break them. In fact, we saw something this past week that showed up, I saw on social media quite a bit. It's a picture I want to show you here. I just grabbed this off of someone's uh, page here and... This was in St. Clair Shores, this beautiful rainbow. And you probably posted something similar, or you saw some of these. How many of you saw the rainbow this week? Okay, lots of people. And when a Christian sees a rainbow, we think of God's promise. We think of God's promise. He made a promise back in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. God promised that he would never, ever again wipe out the entire earth, like the, all the living creatures, with the exception of eight people and two of every animal, Noah, Noah's Ark, if you know the story. Uh, after that, God said, I will never again do that. I promise I won't do that. And to show you that I, um, to remind you of this promise, I will put a rainbow in the sky. So when we see a rainbow, we think of Noah's Ark, but really we should think of the promises of God. There are lots of promises. And the great truth that you want to remember today and always is that when God makes a promise, He never lets you down. God is the greatest promise keeper. I don't know if you can boast that. I don't think I can boast that. But God can. God is the greatest promise keeper. And He has a gift for all of us who are willing to receive it. It's a promise. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Before I can tell you about God's greatest promise, I have to tell you about God's most tragic promise. His most tragic promise happened in the beginning. God created Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were in this lovely garden. God made a a promise to them in this garden. If you have your Bible with you, you can open up to Genesis. It's the first book in the Bible. If you need a Bible, there's one in a chair in front of you. You can have that Bible if you'd like. But you can open up to Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. I will tell you about the first promise that we see in the Bible from God, the tragic promise. It's in verse uh, 16 and 17. It says... That the Lord God commanded the man, that's Adam, Adam, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day, if you eat it, you shall surely die. So Adam and Eve could eat from any tree in the garden, which... If you really think about it and you understand what's happening here is that Adam and Eve were vegetarians. 
They were vegetarians, and all the animals were too in the beginning. In fact, the first time that meat was ever eaten happens after the flood. So they were, they were vegetarians, and some, some people are giving me an evil look right now because um, you really like your meat, but I'm just telling you, it's in the Bible. For a very long time, people lived as vegetarians, and they lived really happy, healthy, long lives on a plant-based diet. Imagine that. And you might be thinking, well, I don't get it. How'd they get protein? Because we're so, like, you know, programmed, right? We're, we think that that's the only place we can get protein. But, you know, there's that magical fruit, beans. <laughs> beans is a lot, there's lots of protein in beans. There, there's my favorite, lentils. And then there's that one that sounds like a karate move, quinoa. I brought a quinoa salad today to the little potluck there. There's lots of ways to get protein, but I encourage you for optimal health, try a plant-based diet, try to get some more plants in there, but not today, we have hot dogs today. <laughs> and we have a lot of hot dogs today, so tomorrow, try it tomorrow. But there was just one tree that was totally off limits to Adam and Eve, just one. They had all those other gar or trees to eat from, but one they couldn't eat from and uh, uh, despite the pictures in the children's Bibles, it really wasn't an apple tree. I, I know, I'm just blowing your mind today. You had no idea. Vegetarians? Not an apple? What's going on? But they, they, they couldn't eat from this, this one tree that God told them not to eat from, but they did it. And they disobeyed God, and when you disobey God, you sin. That's the word for sin. That's what it means. And they died. God said, you shall surely die. They died. Not physically, spiritually. Spiritually, they died. Because that sin separated them from God. God is spirit. We are spirit dwelling in a physical body, but we are separated. Our spirits are separated. So that's what sin did there. And when they disobeyed God, God actually punished them. Imagine that, parents. God didn't give in to their whining. He didn't bargain with them. He didn't bribe them. He disciplined them. Imagine that. Dare to discipline. Great book, by the way. There were no second chances. No second chances. God gave them what he said he would give them. He made a promise. It's a tragic promise, but God is the greatest promise keeper. He gave them the consequences for their sin. And they were banished from that wonderful garden, and they had to live out the rest of their days in a broken, fallen, sinful world. And no thanks to Adam and Eve, so do we. Right? I mean, that's the world we live in. I know we want to make the most of it. I know you try to make the most of it. But the truth is, and you experience it, even when you don't want to experience it, someone cuts you off. Someone only cares about themselves. We were just talking before, you know, the, 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 there, there was a, a crime scene and all the people cared about was themselves. <laughs> I mean, this is the world we live in. It, we're, it's a selfish, dog-eat-dog -dog world. Romans 3.23 sums it up beautifully. For we have all sinned, and we all fall short of God's glory. That's the world we're in. That's the, the, that's, we're descendants of Adam and Eve. It's in our nature to sin and disobey God. And that separates us, and, and that, that really, if you think about it, we're, we're utterly hopeless. We're, we're, we're completely hopeless. There is no hope for us. In fact, I, I really like that part in the movie if this were a movie, um, this would be that part where you're thinking to yourself, how are they ever going to get out of this jam? Like, they're tied up, they're sinking a thousand feet into, you know, into the depths of the sea, they're unconscious, there's no way. You know what I'm talking about, the part of the movie where it's like, it's just, there's just no way that they're going to get out of this. I like that part of the movie because I know it's a movie and I know what's going to happen next 
is somebody's going to rescue them, and that somebody is usually the hero of the story. Right? I mean, that's the exciting part. But we're mankind, and mankind is truly helpless. We, we can't rescue ourselves. We cannot prevail on our own. We're not the hero of our own story. And sadly, we're destined for damnation. Heaven would just remain the same. The angels and the big three. No people. Unless God makes another promise. And he does. Not far after. Genesis 3.15. You don't have to wait very long as you read through Genesis. You'll see God makes another wonderful promise. In fact, it's the greatest promise. Genesis 3.15. So if you still have in Genesis there, you can flip a little further to Genesis 3.15. Gen he says, speaking actually to the one who tempted Adam and Eve, the, the serpent, the devil, the evil one, he says, I will put enmity, that's hatred, between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and, he, and you shall bruise his heel. So this is the very first prophecy in the Bible of the Messiah. God promised a Messiah, a, a person, anointed person to come and save the sinners. Save us. Save God's people. Um, the Old Testament has, some scholars would say, over 300 prophecies of this one person. And, and when you stack them all up, it's amazing because you think to yourself, well, that, how can one person fulfill all of these prophecies? It seems impossible. But yet, the New Testament... Much of the writings of the New Testament are showing that Jesus fulfilled the Messiah's prophecies, the prophecies of the Messiah. So Jesus is the, is the Messiah. In fact, Romans 5, 8. As you can see, Romans is, is very good at explaining the gospel, the good news of Jesus. In Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners... Jesus the Christ. The Christ is the Messiah. Jesus died for us. That's God's greatest promise, fulfilled by Jesus. And if you'll go just a little bit further, one more chapter, Romans 6, 23. And that's a verse that really sums up all of Romans, the book of Romans. In fact, two promises exist in that one verse. And that's where I want to settle in on, right there. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I know you may have heard this before. I'm sure I'm not the first person to ever preach on Romans 6.23 and talk about heaven and hell and sin and all of that. But if you have ears to hear and eyes to see, there's a great truth here because God is the ultimate promise keeper. He keeps his promises and in this verse, the first part of the verse, you see the most tragic promise. The wages of sin is death. That's a promise. Death meaning separation from God forever. But the gift of God is life through Jesus. That's the greatest promise. And it's a contrast, because in a, wa a wage is something you earn. You go to work, you get a wage. It's, it's something you earn. You earn your sin, earns death. But God has a gift, free. Free, no strings attached, free. Eternal life. It's hard to believe. Like, why would someone turn down this free gift? They must think that there's some strings attached. I mean, what, why, do, why would they turn down a free gift? I mean, uh, perhaps you, you've tried to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus. You're gung-ho, you love coming to church, and you try to share with others and invite them to church, and they're just like, nah, I don't want to do that. 
I don't want eternal life. I don't want the free gift. Because they think there's some kind of strings attached. You know, like if I, if I believe like you, then I got to go to church on Sunday. And I like to stay home on Sunday and do my own thing. I don't want to go to church and be around nice, genuine people that love me. Ugh. Or, I, you read your Bible. I don't want to read my Bible. It's, I might learn about my Creator and my Savior. Oh, God, I don't want to do that. I'm going to have to serve other people and help people and feel good about myself. Or do, no, I don't want to do that. Strings attached. It must be the reason why people don't receive God's free gift. I'm joking, obviously, but I don't think that's the reason at all. I think it's they don't believe because they can't believe. And I can't believe they don't believe because I believe. I believe in Jesus. I believe he left heaven to become like us. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died a sacrificial death, and God raised him from the grave. I believe it. Do you believe it? But not everyone believes it. But if you do believe it, then you have the free gift. You've received it. Because you can't believe without having that gift. You can't even believe. So if you believe the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you've received the free gift. These two girls that were up here, Hayden and Leanne, they believe. That's why they're getting baptized. They understand Jesus died for them. They have the faith of a child. They believe. God's greatest promise is also summed up in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And I'm reading it for a reason. It kind of repeats what we've said. Verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen. I like that. How are you saved? Through faith. By grace. The next part says, And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. And I like verse 9. Verse 9 tells us, It's not a result of our works. Every other religion, you work your way to heaven. Not Christianity. No one can boast. I like it because nobody can whine their way into heaven, and they can't work their way into heaven. God doesn't say, oh, fine, I'll give you a second chance. Okay, I'll give you a third chance. Okay, just, just get in here. <laughs> there's no whiners in heaven. They don't whine their way in. And there's no workers. Oh, I, I gave sex amount of dollars. They named that hospital after me. You know, I, I helped so many people. Even Mother Teresa didn't say, look what I did, let me in. No whiners, no workers in heaven. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone. In fact, the only people in heaven are saved sinners. Scott likes to say it in his Bible study. There's two kinds of people in this world. Sinners and saved sinners. Which kind are you? It's a choice we make. Saved by the blood of Jesus. Saved by grace alone through faith alone. Now a question generally pops up. And we, you might have asked it, you might have heard about it before, but does God save everyone? That's a question that sometimes comes up. And maybe you've been in a conversation with others, maybe you've been to a church that actually taught that, that God saves everyone. It's called universalism. There are churches out there. And they believe that God saves everyone. Everybody's going to heaven. It's like an Oprah show. Everybody's <laughs> going to heaven. But that's not true. Um, you can't pick uh, verses out of the Bible and make them say what you want them to say. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't save everyone. He saves those that hear the truth about Jesus and from hearing the truth they believe. A universalist church would not preach on Romans 10, 14, and 15. It's not necessary. Romans 10, verse 14 says, Paul writes to this uh, church in Rome, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? 
And then progressively, how are they to believe if they haven't heard? And how do they hear unless someone preaches? How are they to preach unless they are sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are those who preach the good news, the feet of those who bring the good news. Christians are supposed to share the truth so people can believe. I believe that's how God imparts faith in someone when the word is taught, preached, when you witness to the truth, God does something amazing in a person and they believe. Simplest place to start sharing the truth, telling others, is in your own home. With your little children, if you have them. With your neighbors, around your home. You just share the truth. What has God done in your life? If he hasn't done anything then start with you. Got to have a story to tell. And everyone who's a Christian has a story to tell. And don't give me this malarkey that, oh, my story is boring. I've been a Christian my whole life. You know, I didn't go to prison, die, and then come back to life. And You don't need a dramatic story. Your story is dramatic because Jesus is the hero of your story. Tell people your story and tell them how Jesus saved you. How God loves you. How the Holy Spirit lives in you. Share that story and start with your kids, please, if you're parents. Proverbs, it's never too late, by the way. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, a proverb is not a promise from God. Don't confuse that. A proverb is not a guarantee. A proverb is a wise saying that generally is true. There are always prodigal children. That happens. We pray that they will come back to the Lord. But here's what we know. If you raise your children to love God and love others, you encourage them to put their faith in Jesus, and you demonstrate that with your own life there will be an exponential increase chance that your children will do the same. Think about that, parents. I mean, if there's anyone in the world that knows the truth about you and your relationship with God, it's your kids. They're brutally honest. (laughs) They are. They'll tell everybody about you, what you say and what you do. That's what kids do. You did it. So they see you. They watch you. I never forget the story of a young athlete who woke up early every morning during swim season. Swim season, those swimmers get up early. And he gets up every morning super early to go to swim practice. And thinking he's the only one up, he realizes that his dad is always up before him. His dad wakes up early to spend time with his Heavenly Father in prayer. And that, seeing that every day, his father praying, spending time with his father, that left an indelible impression on that young man. What kind of impression do we leave on others by our actions, by what we do? The Apostle Paul took a liking to a young man named Timothy. He raised him up to be a pastor, but he said something about Timothy that he noticed. Verse uh, 5 of chapter 1 in 2 Timothy, he says, I am reminded, he's writing to Timothy now who's a pastor, and he's at the end of his life, and he says, I'm reminded once again of your sincere faith. How did you get this sincere faith, Timothy? What made you so strong in your faith? Ah, it dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and then your mother Eunice, and now dwells in you as well. Parents and godparents and grandparents and uncles and aunts, you have a wonderful opportunity to train up your children to love God and love one another. No one else has that opportunity. No one can replace that role that you play in that child's life. You must teach them the greatest promise of God. 
that there is a gift for them to receive. Salvation. I'm thankful the Steins and the Slacks have taught Hayden and Leanne the truth. God is the ultimate promise keeper. Two promises in one verse. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life. Will you get what you earn or will you receive what God has for you? The free gift. My hope is that you receive the gift. I don't want what I earned. I don't want to be separated from God forever. I want to spend eternity with Him. And the way you do that is you receive that gift. You believe. You've heard the truth. I've shared it with you. It's a simple truth. God loves you. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for you. We sang about it today. We heard the testimony of two children. I've shared the verses in the Bible. It's up to you to make a decision. If you've never made a decision before, you've never said, you know what? This is it. I, I get it now. I believe. And I told you before, you may have heard it a hundred times before, but you know what? Sometimes it's the... 101th time. But when you hear it, when you hear the truth, and you receive it, and you take it in, and you say, I believe, let me tell you, the door is open. The door is open to a life that you couldn't even imagine before. Because God gives us what we can't even imagine. I mean, the blessings will pour out on you in, in, in ways you never realized. Peace that transcends all understanding. A love. The ability to forgive. The fruits of the Spirit will grow in your life. It's amazing when you surrender to the Lord. So I'm going to ask you just to pray to God right now. And, and if you've already prayed that you have received the gift, then pray for someone to share the gift with. Pray that God would put someone in your life that you could tell them about Jesus, tell them your story. But if you've never done it yourself, don't wait, don't hesitate, do it right now. And as you're praying, our team will come up to sing our final song.